people thinking about God, we've got plenty of people that have claimed to be God and that do even in the contemporary era. And um, n- nothing big about claiming to be God. Anyone can, and many have, said that they are God. And we could spend time looking at some of the more recent iterations of those claiming to be God, claiming to be, many of them claiming to be Jesus, God incarnate. But our reasonable choices uh, is, and I'm just following clearly what Lewis, I think, just logically, C.S. Lewis just logically presented as options, and of course, there's nothing genius about that other than to say that if you think about it long enough, you start to recognize someone claiming to be God, you've got to put them in, you know, one of several categories. Like I said, you can look at these folks and say, well, all I have to do is understand where they're coming from and take a look at their lives, and uh, we can start to come to reasonable conclusions about who they are. Well, the first option is that he was delusional. Now, few are willing to go there, but we need to press the case. Listen, if the Bible is an accurate record of what Jesus said and what he taught and what happened, we got to look at what he says, and if he claims to be this all-supreme being that everyone should follow his teachings and be devoted to him because he's coming back into space and time a second time, uh, if you want to dismiss that, you can do that. But one of the ways you'll dismiss it is to saying he's crazy, like most of the people that I've met that claim to be God, and I've met a good handful of them. I can think of several faces right now uh, that I've interacted with. Um, Be a pastor in Southern California. You'll have plenty of people that'll claim to be God. I don't know why I said that, but it's, I've got stories for you if we ever sit around and talk. Few are willing to go here, though, about Jesus, right? They will say, and they will admit, and we should get them to admit, that his teaching was cogent. We still quote it. It's things that he said are etched on, on buildings and, and granite. Uh, his teachings are described with, with phrases like the golden rule. These are the kinds of things that people would say yeah, Jesus was not delusional. His wisdom, in fact, was uh, remarkable, most people will say. Why do all the religions have to deal with Christ and put him in some category above us, which most of them will, and if not above us categorically, at least something that we can all attain to, but it's still higher and we need to, to work our way there. In other words, he is, he's not delusional. He's not someone that we dismiss as crazy we see his wisdom is remarkable. Now, again, let's just start thinking through what the Scripture says about Christ. And I'll give you several references here, just a few, I guess, as it relates to this one. But Luke chapter 20, verses 39 and 40, just think through how he related to the crowds. The scribes, of course, were professional scholars. And some of the scribes answered the teacher after Jesus answered their questions and their disputes that he entered into, you have spoken well, and they no longer dared to ask him any questions. He, they tried to entrap him constantly in the pages of the Gospels, and Jesus always comes through these uh, with a kind of response like this, that they say, well, he's definitely got his intellectual act together. Luke chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, this is when he was 12 years old. The only account that we have of him between his infancy and his adult ministry. After three days, they found Jesus in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So from the earliest of ages, at least depicted historically in the scriptures, he's presented as someone who they're amazed at his insight and his understanding. And how he's able to answer people as it relates to biblical questions or theological knots, the knotty logical conundrums he was able to answer. Matthew 22, 34, and 35, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, now we've gone from the scribes, professional scribes, to the Pharisees, this very important group of leaders that set up all kinds of traditions and, and legal laws for Israel, and the Sadducees, who were kind of the regal, aristocratic leaders of, of Israel, these were high-ranking people. Well, when the Pharisees heard that he had kind of put the Sadducees to shame, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So they were constantly going at him to try and see if they could try and subdue his logic and his intelligence. So the scripture is peppered with, and we could go on with statements about how Jesus was known to be intellectually sound. He was not delusional. 
Oh, I got one more. And no one dared to answer him a word, nor from that day uh, did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So we have a lot of that in Scripture. Oh, I got more. They could not reply to these things. Luke 14, 6. All right. Jesus was deceptive. If you know the triad of answers in Lewis, you've got, you know, a, a lunatic, a, a liar lunatic or Lord, and I, I'm just making these my own and have through the years. He's either delusional or he's deceptive. Well, if you want to accuse him of this, either. Right? They'll want to blame it on the Bible, perhaps, because they can think about people that have somehow messed up the Bible. Well, hopefully we can logically defend the veracity of Scripture, the truthfulness and protection of the transmission of the Bible. So now what? Now you're going to say Jesus was lying about his status, that he said he was something he wasn't, whether that be the Messiah or God. Um, if you want to accuse him of that, but you need to press them in that regard. Certainly had a truthful reputation, and we can go throughout the Bible and see. The disciples sent, they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, another group of people. They were very influential in the first century, obviously had warmed up to Herod's family and that dynasty. And they said, teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God truthfully, and you don't care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. I mean, that's quite a mouthful and a resume builder if you're trying to impress people with your commitment to truth, that you don't care. You're not just saying whatever people want to hear. I mean, he certainly had a reputation of being truthful. Mark 7, 37, and, when they were, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well. He's not a liar. He's not a cheat. He doesn't say things that are not truthful. He's not deceptive. John 14, 6, he even pre presents himself that way, which, by the way, will set you up for criticism. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You start calling yourself the truth, the embodiment of truth, you're going to have people that want to entrap you. And certainly the Herodians wanted to trap him, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Pharisees, and we could go on, the, the, the Sanhedrin, they all wanted to trap Christ, and you start saying things like, I'm the truth, and we're going to try and find him somehow lying and so he opened himself up to a lot of scrutiny that didn't yield any reasonable accusation of his deception. John 18, 37, Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus answered, saying that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Truth, truth, truth. I'm about truth. I present the truth. I am the truth. People said, will you speak the truth? We know you speak the truth. So Jesus, in every way, had presented himself as truthful. I don't think you can, from the documents, if we can establish those to be reliable, come up with a picture in Scripture to dismiss what he says because he's deceptive or because he's delusional. So you're left with, and I don't know what else you could say, you either attack the source, you attack the history, or you try and slot him into being deceptive or delusional, or you're stuck with him being divine, which has big implications. And the biggest one, and we won't get into this because this starts to get pastoral. We can do this on a Sunday morning, but you need to listen to him and do what he says, right? Think about it. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed, appointed heir of all things. Everything belongs to him, through whom he created the world. So here is Christ having all authority, and he is the spokesperson of God. And if he was that person... As it goes on to say, the exact representation and imprint of God's divine nature, if that's who he is, then we're stuck opening the Bible and doing what it says. And in the modern era, in my evangelism, how often I, I just say, listen, this is what Jesus taught, right? If, you, if he's not crazy, he's not delusional, then you've got to respond to what he says. God is speaking to you by the words and teaching of Christ, and we can't wiggle our way out of it. Well, not that the logic was unique to C.S. Lewis in doing that. I at least should give you the original quote. And since he was a great author, though his theology wasn't always that tight, uh, he certainly knew how to write. And don't ask me about that right now. But he put it this way initially in that liar, lunatic, Lord trio of options. He said, you can shut Jesus up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. There's the 
the options. He's delusional, he's deceptive, or he's divine. But let us not come, and I love this sentence here, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher, right? He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. As I've said, the more extreme the claim, right, the more polarized the options in terms of your response, right? The more extreme the claim, the more polarized the options are for your response. And you can't be neutral about Christ. And that's where most of your friends and neighbors want to go. What am I going to do with Jesus? Well, he's a good teacher. I think he had some good things to say. Well, he had more than good things to say, as we're going to see for the rest of our time. He claimed to be completely in charge of all things and that you should do whatever he says. So you can't stick him in this middle ground of being a good teacher. Either he's crazy or he is um, deceptive and pulling one over on everyone or he's actually who he says he is. So... That's a good place to start. That's just how we should think in presenting Christ to people is that they don't have many options here. You can't just be a good guru or a good teacher or a good prophet or a good ethicist or a good life coach. 